Third Defense Force 5, also known in Japan as Ground Ball Defense Sailor Moon Character Army, is one of those things that feels like a fever dream and should not exist because of how absurd this game can be. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever wanted a game that would have turret sky levels of quotable voice lines? Battle scale of Mountain Blade that makes you feel like you're in Supreme Commander. Fully destructible environments. Enemy variety that keeps it fresh the entire playthrough. Ragdoll physics and dismemberment system the likes of Dead Space and Soldier of Fortune 2. Four different classes that play completely differently. Ah, so many weapons that it puts Borderlands to shame because they're actually different from each other. And, on top of all that, the face of the promo campaign for the latest game is none other than Japanese Gilbert Gottfried. You can pretty much shut the review off right here. But please, keep watching, because I need to monetize my existence. Alright everybody, pop quiz. How do you think this game came to be? Because I know that there's something weirdly American about bombing a threat into oblivion thousands miles away from you, but no, Uno Reverse, actually. It was made in a bombed country. As if you couldn't tell that from the literal first five seconds of the video. But okay. And here's what happened inside a small Japanese game dev studio called Sandlot. One day in the office, Yukio said, Hey guys, I rented a bunch of kaiju movies. To which Asamu replied, Oh my, they are the cat's pajamas. Let's watch it right now. And so, sometime during the screening, Ryunosuke suddenly hit with a revelation. Hold it! That guy, that fucking guy. Let's make a whole video game franchise about a completely ordinary person and his insurmountable struggle against the uncountable horrors, which is a totally original premise for our industry and particularly our country. Right? And so, the first game in the series was published exactly 20 years ago in 2003 in Japan. Now let's get back to 2023. After many, 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 many sequels that were improving the formula, uh, we have now completed the loop and can start anew. And so I'm making a review on EDF 5, which is currently the latest installment available not just to one country that still uses fax machines and floppy disks, but to the outside world too. EDF 5 is important because it acts as a complete reboot and a remake of both Monster Attack and Global Defense Force, which are the precursors of the EDF franchise. So it's a perfect entry point by all accounts. So what is the franchise, you ask? In a nutshell, it's a third-person shooter where your gameplay will be divided between two equally important tasks. Saving Japan from illegal immigrants and singing karaoke with your office colleagues. It's only with our sacrifice that mankind can still exist down here in paradise. To defend our dearest mother earth, we're ready to give up our lives. Storytelling here is at the level of arcade machines, and honestly, the plot would get in the way of all the fun we're having. I'm sure you've already noticed, the game looks at least 10 years old regardless of what year it is right now. And I don't mean that as an insult or a compliment. Graphics look like they're straight from the arcade too, but that's kind of a point here. There are no cutscenes or anything, and the entire plot is being fed to you through the walkie-talkie with no subtitles. A large number of monsters confirmed. Stay alert. Well, there is a plot in this game, although you can easily miss out like 90% of it, because you can't hear it over the explosions and constant screaming. Remember, no cutscenes. But if you're still curious about the story, it goes a little something like this. Somehow, Australian insects escaped their confinement from the prison island and have invaded the rest of the world. It is your duty to eliminate those abominations. The insects, not the Australians. But really, this isn't a game where you need to care about the story or spoilers. Here, I'll prove it right now. You start as an underground parking security guard with a pest problem and end up becoming a general of the planet that kills alien god. Don't concern yourself about such silly things as plot, character progression, emotional investments and the like. Do not get me wrong, they're all there, but we're here for the spectacle. And now, allow me to explain the bizarre phenomenon of why people like this game so much. 
I've been told that YouTube viewers are on average 28% smarter than dogs, so you will have little problem understanding what I'm about to say next. Here goes. Developers just wanted to make a fun game and they succeeded. That's it. Honestly. For real. Tell me, how many narrative-driven indie games about depression have you played lately? Don't you feel it's enough? They are just as numerous and uninspiring as bullet sequences that plagued every game in early 2010s. And I feel that as a society, we have to move on. EDF, however, is not just a game, but THE game that all other titles should look up to at least a little bit to make them more fun and replayable. Dropping all the pretenses to pursue the high arts approach, it certainly won't win any BAFTA awards. But these games remind us about the humble and awesome roots of the industry, unburdened by corporate greed, flashy gimmicks or social controversy. And now that you know the premise, let's talk about playable characters. There are four of them. Let me tell you something. Play Earth Defense Force 5. Yeah! Oh yeah! Yeah! Oh yeah! A Walmart security guard whose skills include shooting guns and collecting items around him. He also can do emergency avoidance, which is not a special technique that's aimed to create single parent families, it's just how they call dodge in Japan, apparently. His special ability is um, running, which I admit is highly uncharacteristic of security guards, so yeah, quite impressive, I guess. <gasps> His arsenal is solid if you're into conventional arms. And since we're on the subject, let me talk about weapons and explain the loadout system. Every character you play will have at least two weapon slots, which means you can experiment with your setup. But take a look at this. This here is a utility slot. Basically, it either enhances your special ability or it gives you something else like a passive bonus, a vehicle you can use to do donuts, or a giant fucking mecha that can punch aliens in the face. Yeah! And again, every character has their own set of utilities, so you will never get bored from experimenting with different loadouts. It's pretty fun, right? But that's just the beginning. Because if you want to play this game with different chromosomes, we've got you covered, fam. This is the only female character in the game that is literally above all her male comrades. Yeah, you heard me. This Superfly doesn't have a Johnson. I can't leave without my buddy Superfly. Her special ability is sending all the actual players to the epilepsy war because all her weapons look futuristic and cause irreversible damage to your eyes. On the flip side, she's got a jetpack. So it's a wash, really. That jetpack is a blessing and a curse because it comes with the energy meter. And if you miscalculate how much energy you need to recharge your gun while flying away from pursuers, you will face the same fate as all amateur GPU overclockers. Moreover, she has the least amount of HP of all characters, so if you're out in the open, you can die pretty quickly. And I know, her design looks a little bit off if we compare it to the three other classes. But then again, this is a Japanese production, so some game design stereotypes tend to apply. I mean, last time there was some noticeable backlash against sexist designs in Japanese video games and people demanding them to get with the times and make some changes, Emperor Naruhito closed the entire fucking country for two years and said, make me. Stay classy, Japan. In a nutshell, this is the only female character that has a jetpack and a propensity for killing herself with her own weapons. I don't care much for her weapon arsenal, to be honest. Lances can be amazing, sure, but I have no idea how you're supposed to mass murder aliens with them. Which is kind of a main theme here, you know? That's not to say you can't find some ridiculously overpowered weapons like this cannon here. This thing will give you fat stacks of damage. Oh, and speaking of fatness... I've been waiting for this! This guy is called Lancer. He's a Mongolian that came to Japan to become sumo wrestling champion, but he was the only forklift certified person around, so they immediately signed him up for the exoskeleton team. I'm sorry, Chinojo. Your rickshaw career will have to wait. Hold it! Oh, now is the perfect moment to talk about spin offs from the main franchise. You see, Insect Armageddon and Iron Rain were two games that were both outsourced, but Insect Armageddon gave us fencers, whereas Iron Rain gave people cancer. <coughs> World Brothers was okay, I guess. What I'm trying to say here is that fencers are a new addition to the crew, relatively speaking. 
first time you play him, you will think that this is a wheelchair accessible class. But just like with electric scooters that were designed to kill people like me who can't afford a car, you can easily remove the speed limiter and go on a killing spree. You can become virtually invincible if you time your dashes and jumps well. Finally, you can apply your musician skills to something meaningful in your life. Go ahead and tell your parents that you're not a complete disappointment. If you have a shield, you can reflect all the enemy projectiles, which essentially makes this one of the most devastating attacks. So yeah, you can use shields with this guy, but we all know that real men don't use protection. Wait, that's not what I meant. What I'm saying is that you shouldn't cover behind the shield all the time, when you have those dashes anyway. It is much more useful to equip another gun sometimes. And this guy has guns aplenty. Miniguns, cannons, lasers, mortars. Guys, I think... I think I am the turret section now. But this section I can get behind, because the last time I had this much fun with miniguns was in Serious Sam, and that was 20 years ago. But if you are coming down hard after playing another 100 hours of Monster Hunter, you can go melee with this chunky boy. You want to play whack-a-mole with humanity's most dangerous enemy? Sure, have a hammer or a sword, my dude. Just go nuts. One problem though, there are no combos in EDF, so you can't suplex Metal Gears like Raiden, but you can still make some relatively cool moves with this guy. Yeah, no. Friendship ended with Fencer. Now Air Raider is my best friend. Air Raider is a class that you play one time, then drop immediately because he doesn't have any good weapons yet. But in reality, this is the class that you play when Doom soundtrack finally kicks in. So if you're one of those guys who shines laser pointer at flying helicopters or airplanes, you'll love this. Because now you have an orbital laser operated by the Nazis. This class is actually the strongest, but the learning curve is almost vertical, especially against flying enemies. But don't let it discourage you from playing him. He's actually pretty great and can teach you that war crimes and tactical nukes are perfect alternatives to pesticide. Go go gadget war crimes. Hey, what's the opposite of terraforming? Well, this guy is that thing, whatever it's called. And just take a look at that arsenal. No more sniper rifles or giant shields. My brother in Christ, I have tactical nukes and it's been a long time since Japan has seen one of those. Now, if Wing Diver was polite enough and usually only killed herself due to poor accuracy or untreated depression, this guy's kill count of his own soldiers rivals the number of Joseph Stalin. And speaking of political figures, only Gandhi from Civilization was more trigger happy with nukes than this guy. The dopamine rush you get from airstrikes is unparalleled. But to use any of his toys, you need to send enough aliens to the past tense to recharge your meter. So when you're bombing that orphanage next time, make sure to tag at least one or two hostiles, okay? So with Air Raider, I'm not even sure that the aliens are our main threat. I mean, have you seen the things he does to the infrastructure? I think it would be cheaper to let aliens enslave us. And need I remind you that his weapon, Rule of God, was previously called Genocide Gun. So I actually feel pity for all these ancient species that came to our planet just to die. Let's talk about them. In total, EDF 5 has more than 25 enemies. And like I said, the game maintains a perfect pace of introducing new monsters. And that is an achievement in itself, since the game has so many missions. So many missions. Feels like you've seen too many ants already. Well then prepare to fight your arachnophobia with giant spiders. Had enough of those, you'll be sure to fight flying saucers soon enough. Not sure how they're related, but they're here. Also, insects have bigger versions of themselves. Kinda like a boss encounter. Ooh, remember spiders from every mission? They are robots now. You think that insects is all this game has? Au contraire, mon capitain. There are also Alex Jones' favorite conspiracy amphibians and X-Files aliens. 
I admit, one thing EDF 4.1 has over EDF 5 is that it had actual dragons in it. But fret not my crestfallen soldiers, for this game has tadpoles, like a dragon. And of course, the game features not one, but two giant kaiju monsters that don't violate strict copyright of Toho Company. The list goes on. It is diverse enough to carry you through the game once and then some. What I mean by that is that some enemies are locked behind higher difficulties and DLCs, which is why you're not seeing any of them in this footage I took on my normal first run, ever the professional. There can't be just cannon fodder, right? Somebody must be in charge of this alien invasion. When I first started playing this game, I asked myself, this is a Japanese production, so are we gonna fight some kind of god at the end of the game? I was right, this guy, nameless. who is actually called Silver Guy in the Japanese version. But I guess the American division said they have some problem with calling people different colors now, plus they wanted to have an even more unoriginal name. So they changed it. Unfortunately, he's the only boss he will fight. But, believe it or not, he doesn't make the game less fun. All because almost every enemy requires you to fight differently. And this is how it doesn't get boring, even though the game has 110 missions in the main campaign. Yeah, 110 missions. And how many maps, you ask? In this game, you will go to lots of different locales. And here is what we have for you. Emerald Hill Zone, Mitsubishi Cement Plant, somewhere in Europe, Viet Cong tunnels from the POV of Viet Cong, dedicated beach episode, Australian petting zoo, and many others. The locations are numerous, and maps are super big. So big, in fact, that it took me 20 or so levels to figure out I'm playing the same maps. In EDF5, we have two types of missions. Kill everything that moves, or wave defense. Same thing, really. By the end of every mission, there won't be much left of the map, because EDF has a fully destructible environment. It's ironic how this small and relatively cheap B-game lets you do stuff no AAA mainstream game ever tries to attempt. Because here you have giant scale battles in fully destructible city maps against massive hordes of enemies with lots of allies and vehicles and mechas and all kinds of crazy bullshit. This is what gaming should be about, not walking down a straight corridor between cutscenes directed by Hollywood dropouts. Gentle reminder to all game designers that unskippable cutscenes are the worst thing since corporate Memphis. No cutscenes, no cinematic intro to lead us into the game, no nothing. It's not one of those it gets good in 800 hours kind of games. Okay, maybe I'm being too judgmental here, but this is pure arcade gaming. What's an arcade without a few friends? I was actually shocked by how much fun I was having in offline mode on normal difficulty. So it took me a while to take the multiplayer pill. And boy am I glad I did. Single player and multiplayer have different progressions. So even if you completed your SP campaign like I did, it means jack shit here. Now you're playing with the big boys and you gotta prove it. There are plenty of games being hosted, all requiring different levels of skill, so you'll be sure to find a place to eliminate some immigrants. I have to say that both the enemy's health and the amount of fun you'll be having is going to scale, so don't feel ashamed if you have to dial down your difficulty a bit. But at the same time, go ahead and try beating the last couple of missions on one of the hardest difficulty in co-op without over-farming. That is going to be the most fun shit you'll ever do, having to plan a strategy for the whole map and barely surviving the onslaught of death coming onto you. Oh, but here's something very important. Even if you cleared the single-player campaign, now you will notice that for some reason you cannot equip most of your weapons. And now is as good a time as any to talk about replayability and weapons. EDF gives us tons of replayability in two interrelated points, weapon drops and difficulty settings. When you first play EDF offline or online, several difficulty levels will be unavailable. You can unlock them by clearing the game on easy, normal or hard. This unlocks hardest and inferno. This, my friend, is hell. If you feel lucky, I should quickly warn you that difficulty gap between harder and inferno are way more noticeable than between normal and hard. These two difficulties are meant to be played only after you farm enough armor and enough weapons. Oh, by the way, armor is a bit of a misnomer, because it actually increases your maximum HP forever, so be sure to pick it up at every chance. If you play as only one class, armor trickles down to other classes as well, so you won't feel super weak when you try them later on. Best weapon drops are locked behind higher difficulties and later missions, so not only do you fight beefier enemies, you also can unlock extended arsenal. 
I would tell you more, but then we would have to consult the Excel spreadsheets. Basically, you need to remember two things. Harder difficulties give you better loot, later missions generally give you better weapons. Improving weapons also means two things, levels and stars. Weapon level acts as a threshold, effectively prohibiting you from using it on earlier missions online only. And stars indicate how powerful your weapon is. That's why stars are more important than levels, remember that. My advice is to start with hard difficulty and then switch to normal when you start feeling the struggle. Don't worry about the weapons, you'll get them afterwards. I mean, look at this shit. Now I feel like a child who had fun with my toys, but now the game is asking me to clean up my room. Yes, Mr. Peterson, I'll clean up everything. Up yours, woke moralist. We'll see who cancels who. Oh yeah, let's talk about audio. Audio is uh, simultaneously good and bad. Can't talk about music though. Switched it off in my desperate attempt to hear the plot messages. And stop the disaster from spreading. As I said before, the battle scale is great, but this boy oh boy, those mistake. screams and moans can get annoying pretty fast. Your comrades in arms never shut the hell up, but that's just to give you the taste of authentic Japanese interjections. They're just speed reading through all of their lines before they die. But what is a B movie without horrible script and acting? Well, I couldn't be happier here, because the game is legit House of the Dead levels of kindergarten script and voiceover. I mean, just take a look at this. The voice lines are filled with cheese from start to finish, and I love it. And here is the coolest part of the dialogue. The lines are selected at random. Now, where have I seen that? Should we gather for whiskey and cigars tonight? Never doubt it. So, on top of the B-movie script writing, we also have randomly generated banter from soldiers. Whoever came up with the idea deserves a medal. Thanks for showing us the wonders of the Chinese room experiment. So, can you really enjoy a game that always plays like a B-movie, pays lip service to its plot, and the weapon customization and armor farming are bloated to the extreme? Yeah, you totally can. If the idea behind the game is solid, then it's more than okay to take away certain elements from a boilerplate game development formula to make an even sharper, clearer game. Sometimes you just wanna blast some stuff and make big explosions without investing much, and arcade games scratch that itch perfectly. I mean, where else can you find Sam Raimi's style of over-the-top screaming extras with Joel Schumacher's corny level of dialogue? EDF is a switch-off-your-brain type of fun in an offensive sort of way. Perfect jump-on, jump-off game. It's like I'm playing Starship Troopers, but I'm in Garry's mod at the same time. It's that type of stupid and type of fun. And there's this quote I like. A story in a game is like a story in a porn movie. It's expected to be there, but it's not that important. It's not applicable all of the time, of course, but I do feel that every once in a while everybody just wants to pick a game and play it purely for its fun gameplay and nothing else. Not something serious that makes me feel empty after I beat it. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I love games like Nier, Enderal or Transistor, but sometimes you want to have some harmless and brainless fun. And it seems that with each passing year I find it harder and harder to find such a game. Arcade games are games in their purest form, really. I can load a PDF, pick any mission, pick one of four classes, pick their weapons, and then just destroy aliens. That's all it takes. This game cares more about you having fun than checking all the boxes of modern game tracks, and I love it for being so bold. It's nice to know that even after 20 years, the arcade genre still lives on. And I can always play the game and enjoy it like 10 years old me would enjoy it too. I don't even need coins to continue playing it. In other words, EDF is perfect at what it's aimed at. I can be damn sure I will enjoy my time with it. And the Japanese are always great at making alien threats seem believable. One thing I know for sure is that someday, somehow, they will strike again when we least expect it. The aliens, not the Japanese. Oh, by the way, a magician told me that YouTube wants me to say please like and subscribe. I would never have thought that I would do this, but hey, $20 is $20. Thanks for watching.